The final three sections of Rule 9 deal with the outcomes of play. We'll talk about what happens when one or more people commit a fault, and how to handle unusual circumstances that involve issuing replays and delays. Between replays and delays, there are 24 different scenarios that are outlined in the book. We won't go through all of them here, but we will touch on the more common ones. So make sure you take the time to read through the rules and familiarize yourselves with the ones that aren't as common. The first four articles of Rule 9-7 describe types of faults. Again, we've got some terms to learn here. When a team breaks a rule, that's called a fault, and the penalty is a point for the opponent and the right for the opponent to serve the next ball, which is called a loss of rally. If each team commits a fault at the same moment, that's called a double fault. One example might be that an attacker on team A and a blocker on team B both commit a net fault during play at the same instant. Now the referees should try to discern if one team committed the fault first, but if that can't be determined or if the referees are certain that the faults happened at the same time, then the outcome is a replay. However, if the faults occur during a dead ball, this would likely be a conduct or an administrative issue, then the serving team is penalized, followed by the receiving team. For example, if two opposing players taunt each other through the net during a dead ball and the referee determines that conduct cards are required for both players, then the serving team should be shown their card first. The reason for this is that if the faults result in a loss of rally, then the serving team will receive the loss of rally first, and then the receiving team will receive a loss of rally second, and so the net result is that both teams will rotate, and then the serving team will continue serving with their next server. If a team commits more than one violation of the same rule at the same moment, then a multiple fault has occurred. An example might be if two blockers on team A both contact the net while trying to block. Now there are no two point plays in volleyball, so just penalize one of these faults. A similar rule is the simultaneous fault, in which a team commits violations of more than one rule at the same time. An example might be if a blocker on team A illegally reaches beyond the net to interfere with the opponent's play on the ball while also contacting the net. Once again, no two point penalties are allowed, so pick one of the two faults and penalize it. However, if the simultaneous faults occur during a dead ball, all penalties are assessed. Uh, if a substitution is delayed by team A at the same time that the referee hears a player on team A complain loudly, then the referee should penalize both of those faults. Articles 5 and 6 just give specific names to faults that are described but not named explicitly elsewhere in the rules. So here we learn about a double hit and a foot fault. Rule 9.8 defines the term replay and then lists nine reasons that a replay can be declared. A few of the most common reasons are listed here. Remember that in most instances, there is room for referee judgment about whether a replay should be awarded. For example, if a ball hits a vertical backboard, the referee must decide whether the backboard truly interfered with a player's legitimate play on the ball. If the ball would have continued out of play had the backboard not been there, then the judgment should be that the ball is out rather than giving the team a replay. If a horn goes off but everybody plays on as normal, then there's no reason to stop play and declare a replay. If a team complains after they lose the point that the horn went off, then the referee can reply that in their judgment, the horn did not affect the play. Article two states that when a replay is granted, teams may not make any requests until the replay is over. The one exception is that requests may be made if the replay is granted due to an injury. When an injury happens, the team with the injured player may request timeouts to allow the injured player to recover or request a substitution or Libro replacement, but only for the injured player. 
Rule 9-9 defines an unnecessary delay and identifies 15 causes of delays. Here are a few of the more common ones that we see, and they usually revolve around substitution and timeout requests. If a substitution is acknowledged and the, substitu and the substitution is not legal, not carried out properly, or is withdrawn, then the result is an unnecessary delay. Bear in mind that we can afford some grace to inexperienced teams early in the season or for corrections that are made quickly. For example, if a substitute reports to the subzone with a bracelet on, whereupon it's noticed by the R2, if the player can remove the jewelry quickly without significantly delaying the sub, then no unnecessary delay needs to be charged. Let's see an example of an unnecessary delay. At the end of this play, the team on the left will request a substitution by having a player run into the substitution zone. Well, after the substitution is processed, a second substitute runs into the substitution zone. This is a delay in properly completing a substitution. The R2 denies the second substitution. Off screen, the R1 whistles and signals an unnecessary delay. The penalty for the first unnecessary delay by a team is an administrative yellow card. To issue this penalty, the R1 should whistle, hold a yellow card against the wrist that corresponds to the offending team, and offer an explanation to the captain about the reason for the delay. The R2 should explain the reason to the coach and then ensure that the scorer has the delay recorded properly on the score sheet. For a second unnecessary delay by the same team in the same set, an administrative red card is charged. Again, the referee should whistle, hold the red card against the wrist corresponding to the offending team, and offer an explanation to the captain while the R2 explains to the coach. Finally, because any red card results in a loss of rally and point, the R1 should show the loss of rally signal, and the, as well as the R2, and the R2 should verify that the penalty point was recorded properly on the score sheet and on the visual scoreboard. Administrative cards do not require the head coach to be seated the way red conduct cards given to someone on the bench do. Also, although administrative cards are progressive within a set, they do not carry across sets. Every set, both teams get a clean slate with regard to unnecessary delays. However, a team that repeatedly delays a match can be charged with an unsporting conduct, and conduct cards are progressive across sets. Okay. We have completed Rule 9. You are almost there. Be sure to really go back and study up on the way these rules are worded. It's crucial not just that we know what they mean, but that we can speak in the language of the rules to communicate with players and coaches. Even veteran volleyball officials need to spend time with the verbiage of the rules so they can make sure they're quoting the right rule set for the match that they're working. Make sure you write down your questions and bring them to your mentors. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the court.